Mary was 23 and had attended two colleges, Wisconsin State and the University of Wisconsin, earning two degrees before I got out of high school. An efficiency expert, in a hurry, she might put on the first two shoes she could find, even if they didn't match. Charlie loved it. The downside of her efficiency was impatience. She could be frustrated by delay, and her irritation showed, but she didn't often speak it. She might have been called taciturn, tough at worst, abrupt, stub-jawed, button-lipped, and closed-minded, but never for long. She was bright and attractive. Her will was good, and she didn't bother with grudges. Charlie leaned on her for any necessary business and often said she had a lot of love. Mary and I were soon joining him on his morning expeditions, exploring the forest of redwoods, oak, bay laurel, rhododendron, poison oak, and who knew what else. Seeming random swatches of land had been cut bare while others were overgrown with brush. We stayed, for the most part, on denuded paths where we could walk with ease. When Charlie ventured into the thickets, I found myself feeling edgy about getting spiders in my hair. I thought I loved the woods, but not like he did. He seemed to think they called to him. We followed him one day on an exhaustive journey he felt compelled to make in response to something he could not specify. At last, he declared it to be a circle of three tall redwoods he seemed to consider personages. Despite my ordinary lack of concentration, I lay on my back in the center of this circle with Mary and him for most of the afternoon. Young sequoias look like Christmas trees, with needled branches from bottom to top, but mature trees often are bare on their lower halves. From this perspective, the three trees appeared to get closer at the top, as if confiding in one another. I think of Charlie's trees as the three graces of classical myth and art. Whatever they communicated to him, he kept to himself. He certainly had more stamina and patience than I did. I got cold sooner. I itched. I was unused to being still for half an hour, much less three. He liked to explore until his stomach growled. Then he looked to us for food. The soybeans we'd set out to soak had sprouted. Aside from nibbling their bitter roots, we didn't know what to do with them. When food ran lowest, we got into the car and drove 10 miles to Fort Bragg, a commercial fishing town, all nets, creaking docks and clinking metal, for cheap hamburgers and a takeout window. Charlie ate in the way he did everything, not primly, but with finesse. He appreciated any offer of food or drink whether he accepted it or not. If he liked it, he ate without saying much. If he didn't like it, he just didn't eat much. His tastes were depression era or prison issue. Mary and I were amused to learn that he keenly liked canned fruit cocktail, 
and that, given a choice of any cheese in the world, he'd ask for Velveeta. We had no notion of how differently he'd been raised, first by many individuals, and never in one place for long. He didn't know his father. His original birth certificate marked him not legitimate, and in the 1930s, the word bastard was still in use as a scarlet degradation. His mother had filed a paternity suit against Colonel Walker Scott in 1935, but Charlie didn't speak of it. From immediate and extended family, he went to foster homes, boys' schools, juvenile halls, jails, and prisons. He didn't, then wouldn't, go to school. Tests later assessed his IQ at far above average, but he refused a normal education. His English was colorful, but limited. His grammar unruled. He said ain't and used double negatives and common unnecessary indecencies. Paradoxically, he was a grade A communicator. He compensated, using his face, body, and mainly his brain. He likened the brain to a computer and the mind to its operator. Back then, computers were the size of rooms, and his concept was uncommon. His own computer files were extensive. He'd been exposed to the behaviors, ideologies, and experiences of hundreds of mostly men by the time he was 20. But we didn't learn about Charlie's early life until later. Instead, he entertained us with anecdotes about his more recent past in each of the two federal prisons off the West Coast. He mimicked the sometimes pathetic or unsavory characters with a fondness and honesty that broke us in half laughing. One memory was of a couple of old glue sniffers on a recreation yard, one standing rigid, looking skyward, sniffing a rag doused in factory glue. The other one approaching and asking, What are you doing? They're coming for me. They're coming for me. The first one answered, This is the spot. Who? Who is coming? They're coming for me. They're gonna send down a beam. Who's coming? I'm gonna go. You can't go. Why? I wanna go. You can't go. There's only room for one. They began wrestling for a place on the imaginary spot. The first one hollering. No, man, you're gonna rank it. <laughs> Mary and I were getting glimpses into one of the world's remaining inner sanctums, and we were intrigued. What I believed about prisoners came from the usual media sources and seemed to be a mixed message. There were true bad people who had to be kept away from the rest of us. And there were people who just ended up in the wrong places at the wrong times. I focused on the latter because since people were fundamentally good, some people were in prison because mistakes had been made, sometimes by police and prosecutors. One look at police brutality against civil rights marchers told that story. Throughout time and great literature, soldiers, scientists, artists, clerics, philosophers, 
kings and queens had all been imprisoned. If I had any objection to the convicted class, it had more to do with morality than illegality. Charlie told a few stories about shirking the requisite prison jobs. In one, he had taken a job in the music room, furnishing, equipping, and maintaining it, while listening to and playing music all day. It was the perfect job for him until a guard found out that there was no music room before Charlie had opened one. He'd had jobs in the kitchen, on a paint crew, and as an orderly. All were short-lived. Sent to work in the prison factory, he did an investigation and started making speeches. Fred, he'd say, I thought you were against war. What do you do in making parts for the military? Joe, how long you been working here? You say you didn't get parole. Don't be surprised. They need you, man. You're building their penitentiaries. He said that he even got kicked out of group therapy because the psychologist said that he confused people. Delighted at having successfully failed so many positions, called Crazy Charlie by some of the staff, he was free to pursue his music. I laughed at these stories, but questioned the morality of avoiding one share of work. Where I was from, people's pride was neither in inherited wealth nor in the ability to beg, swindle, and steal it. But in punctuality, reliability, and steady hard work. Shyness aside, we were a prideful people who didn't call in sick unless we couldn't stand up and stayed well just to keep our noses in the air. Charlie, Mary, and I were partly supported by money that Mary had saved. It didn't seem offensive or irresponsible, but as though we were furthered by providence. And contrary to being a malingerer, Charlie was perpetually engaged. In Mendocino, his explorations led him to facilitate exchanges between strangers. A man looking to unload an old Mercury with the father of a teen who wanted a fix-up car. A woman seeking a cheap propane stove with somebody clear across town who never used his and gave it up for free. Charlie had a knack for this, and he didn't make a thing for it, but new acquaintances and invitations to dinner. His alertness and ability to entertain people were sometimes the only resources supporting us. My memory of the people we visited is a vague amalgam of artistic do-it-yourself couples in well-constructed rented cabins living the good life, unmolested. Besides no fast food franchises, no supermarkets, and no neon at all, Mendocino had no visible police force. Laissez-faire was law and seemed to promote respect. Far from being based in passive weakness, it assumed right behavior and would deal forthrightly with transgression. Northern Woods hippies were no more likely to be bullied than any self-reliant people. 
The cabins were comfortably furnished with antiques or cleverly salvaged scraps of natural, nearly edible materials, instruments of art and music, colorful quilts, weavings and embroideries, dried flowers, clay vessels, incense, candles, and books galore. This life was my ideal. Fresh air, privacy, the forest, the sea. What more could an artist, writer, or naturalist want? However, Mendocino offered no jobs with which to support this lifestyle. Jobs engendered by entrepreneurs were worked by their families and friends. In fact, after the lumber mills were shut down, Mendocino had almost no economy until the late 1950s when a group of local artists formed what was already, loosely, an art colony. This, in the tide pools, brought in more tourists and retreaters for the cabins and exclusive inns. There was talk amongst travelers of a spiritual presence. Charlie remembered waking one night as he felt something leaning on his feet at the end of the bed. Muffet sat tensely watching beside him. They'd both stared into the dark for some time before Muffet had laid down again and he had drifted to sleep. He wondered if we'd been awake. I didn't believe in ghosts. Mendocino had its legendary phantoms. A Victorian lady staring out to sea from a window of one of the finer old houses. A veteran soldier said to have been murdered at Big River Sawmill. And spirits cut adrift by shipwrecks. But these were clearly insubstantial. The East Coast couple, who seemed practical in other respects, said that they had a baby ghost they sometimes heard laughing or crying in a bedroom upstairs. I figured this had to do with their wanting a baby and being unable to conceive. But while crossing the bridge over Big River one night, Charlie, Mary, and I all saw something. It could have been a bum. It was dark. Charlie braked the car and backed it up on the bridge. My pulse bumped into my nerves. No one or thing was visible. But you could never know when a semi might come barreling at can't stop miles an hour while you're in the middle of a dark highway looking for ghosts. We said and saw nothing but a light far out at sea and we drove on. A surprising sense of the supernatural came to me the first time I saw Charlie dance. We were in a cabin, listening to record albums. Mary had gone to town with our hosts. I don't remember the music, but that it moved him. His countenance lifted, and his body appeared weightless. Each finger and limb moving without effort and in perfect rhythm. I was not hallucinating. Yet, his face kept changing as he dipped and dodged, crept and leapt a foot still, winking at me. He moved through the dances of different eras and cultures, nimbly, and in a progression so quick that I could just recognize it 
each before it fell into another. Then he switched to enacting everyday motions in sync with the music. Showering, dressing, brushing his teeth. I'd been trained in dance since childhood, but I had never seen anyone dance like that. The shocking surge of talent and creativity frightened me, and I ran out of the cabin. He found me, sitting beside it, with my knees drawn up to my chest. Chuckling tenderly, he said that he, he was just as surprised as I was. He had never danced like that, he explained, because in prison, tough guys don't dance. He had, however, learned to box. At one of the boys' schools, the Catholic monks taught their charges, using gloves and rules of fairness. Charlie remembered being called a duke and earning a gold and green jacket. He had an edgy but abiding respect for the monks who taught him handball, basketball, and things that would later save my life. Under the bridge at Big River, Mary spread a woven blanket on the sand and unpacked sandwiches she had made at the cabin. She had taken to wearing shorts, her long legs tanning nicely now, despite days dimmed by a, a vague fog. I wore one of her thin skirts that were too long on me, but... I could drape it above my knees when seated and consider myself bohemian. I had quit wearing makeup. Mary didn't wear any and hadn't shaved my legs or underarms since leaving LA. This was becoming the fashion anyway. My high school friends had read that European women didn't shave and were considered very sexy. Last to come from Mary's satchel was lemonade. Wine would have suited my picture better, but Charlie didn't drink it. He said he'd quit drinking alcohol when he admitted to himself that he didn't like the taste. I was surprised to hear him say it. Where I was from, People learned to like the taste. Liquor ads showing sophisticated bon vivants with relaxed bodies and fluid wit were encouragement enough for me to keep trying, even when I didn't like it. But sweet tart lemonade goes well with salty ham and sea air and a mix of warm sand with the distant shush of white water makes a potent sedative. Big River flows beside the Mendocino Peninsula from the forest to the sea. Historical archives recount a boat wreck near Big River survived by German immigrant William Caston in 1850. They say that Caston saw wealth in the Redwoods, built himself a crude cabin, and stayed. Maybe, maybe not. It wasn't Caston who set up the sawmill. On record for the same year that Caston came to land, the trade cargo ship Frolic, a double-masted square rigger sailing from China to gold-booming San Francisco ran aground on a reef less than a mile from the beach at Point Cabrillo. Long after passengers had clambered onto land and left the area, the wreckage of frolic drew scavengers and treasure hunters. Among them, a lumberman named Jerome Ford, traveling from San Francisco. In his archived diary, 
Ford describes the largely unmapped area with no roads, only narrow trails, and numerous swollen rivers to cross, one of which carried off two mules and most of his crew's food and blankets. But Ford recognized that he was surrounded by a fortune in timber. Back in San Francisco, he consulted a wealthy city council member and developer named Henry Miggs. Miggs, who had orchestrated the creation of Fisherman's Wharf and other city venues renowned to this day, sent Ford on a second trip north to secure land for a sawmill. In his diary, Ford reports finding only six men living near Big River, one of them William Caston, who had taken out a land claim. Ford arranged to pay Caston $100, plus first timber, for land on which the Big River Mill would be erected. According to the record, the mill was constructed on the east coast of the U.S. and shipped whole in a schooner that Henry Miggs had purchased around South America and went up the coast to San Francisco and then, with a full crew of managers and laborers, north to Big River. Thus began the export of Mendocino's forests the sawn redwoods taken by boatload, not only to San Francisco, but across the world. One of the first mill operators later lamented his part in what now looks like a desecration. But the town of Mendocino grew, passing through several names, including Big River Township and Miggsville. Fine homes were built, a church, a hotel, families were brought in, and along the riverbanks and the outskirts in places colloquially known as Portage Flat and Fury Town. Sawyers, mill workers, and cooks lived in digs to which they were accustomed. They were immigrants from the Azores, China, Denmark, Finland, Germany, Italy, and Sweden. In the late 1800s, a visiting journalist explained Northern California's lumber business to readers of Harper's Magazine as follows. The coastline is broken at frequent intervals by the mouths of small streams. Sawmills are placed wherever a river mouth offers the slightest shelter to vessels loading. There are even mills which offer no lee. And here the adventurous schooner watches her opportunity, holes under a perpendicular cliff, receives her lading in the shortest possible time, and her crew think themselves fortunate if they get safely off. Big River is one of the best lumber ports. But even here, vessels are lost every winter. One of the old residents told me he had seen more than 100 seamen perish in the 20 years he had lived here. I was also shown the strange and terrible cave into which a schooner was sucked in a sudden gale. Her masts were snapped off like pipe stems, and the hole was jammed into the great hole in the rock, where it began to thump with the swell, so that two of the frightened crew were at once crushed on the deck by the overhanging ceiling of the cave. Five others hung on until ropes were lowered to them. A more terrifying situation can hardly be imagined outside of a hashish dream. Within three years of selling property for the Big River Mill, William Caston told people 
that the area became too populated for him. From the six men in 1851, it now counted more than 600. So Caston sold his remaining land to a William Kelly, whose name remains prominent in Mendocino to this day. Developer Henry Mix's name, however, does not. After finding himself in deep debt, Miggs, still a well-regarded San Francisco alderman, stole blank city certificates from the San Francisco's treasurer's office and made them out to himself, increasing his account by $800,000. In October of 1854, knowing that discovery of his theft was imminent, he absconded during the hours of darkness, taking his entire family out of the country and leaving a financial shockwave that rocked the city from one end to the other. Though Miggs was unknown to have ever actually been in Mendocino, and despite his outlaw status, he would manage to have much of Mendocino shipped to him. Charlie pulled Mary's car to the roadside, near some salt-corroded resort trailers and a scallop of sheltered shore. In the distance, gulls and pipers glided above the water and tiptoed along its edges. It looked like another good place to spend an afternoon. Kicked back on the heels of our hands, Mary and I fiddled driftwood bits between our toes and let the waves lull us while listening to Charlie fine-tune his hobby. He had made his first guitar from a cigar box, strung with rubber bands, and later constructed one in a prison wood shop. He said that he had played in state institutions during the 40s and 50s, but that Alcatraz had the only music program in the federal system, and it took him four years to get a guitar into another prison. Other prisoners had given him pointers. Among them was former gangster Alvin Carpus during the end of a long federal term for crimes committed in the 30s, with the press labeled Mob Barker Gang. Charlie didn't give us details. I read about it in the newspaper a few days later. Interviewed from his home in Canada, Carpus was quoted as saying that he'd taught Charlie to play the steel guitar back when Charlie gambled, and was known as Tips. Incrementally, I learned that Charlie had been in custody in Kentucky, Ohio, West Virginia, Illinois, Indiana, Virginia, New York, Florida, California, and some states in between. Squinting through the splintered sun, Thoughts came to me unbidden and passed unparalyzed until three bare-legged children stood over us, none older than seven, staring at Charlie and at the guitar. He engaged them in conversation, and they proceeded to tell him that they were living in one of the trailers by the road, and that their mother allowed them the run of the beach as long as they stayed away from the water. I was impressed by their directness and by their independence. I thought they were cute, but I listened to little of what they said. Charlie, on the other hand, asked them philosophical questions I considered beyond their understanding and gave their answers more import than I thought they warranted. He demonstrated guitar chords and entertained them for much of the afternoon with lively songs that seemed to excite them. 
until their fidgeting quieted and they stood still and they stood lit with sunset watercolors and wondrous expressions. The faint voice of a woman turned them toward the highway and back to Charlie. Mary and I waved to a distant figure leaning from one of the trailers. Dancing foot to foot, they waited until she had called again. And Charlie looked up, nodding to them. Then they excitedly said goodbye and ran to her. I was a little stunned by this exchange, and none of us spoke. We watched the sun through a thickening mist that threatened to run ashore. I cringed. Fog, to me, was like dawn to a vampire. The halo of fuzzy curls it fashioned hadn't been stylish since the 1800s. As we got up to leave, Charlie asked, How are you going to learn from what you look down at? I knew he was talking to me about those kids. How are you going to learn from what you look down at? I wanted to deny it and defend myself, but he was right. I did look down on children for being uneducated and untrained. I thought everybody did. I liked to think myself a humble egalitarian. But in fact, I looked down on about half of all adults for being too trained on rigid religious types, on most rich people. All of the white people of the southern United States and a long list of other people I'd never met. Not to get into the animal and plant kingdoms. I felt a slow seep of shame hemorrhaging across my face. And just as I felt shame, we were stopped short when a white-haired, spook-eyed fisherman scuttled across our path, muttering something dreadful about fog, as though it could overtake and drown him. I felt clammy and queasy. A swollen roller walloped the rocks, and we left that beach. Discomfort plagued me during those tepid days. The wood splintered and sticky. The rough coastal bluffs damp and dangerous. Even the cabin was unwelcoming. I couldn't find a place to rest. Aloof by appearances, I hoped Charlie would approach me. When he did, I snubbed him. One day, Mary purposely left me alone with him in a neighbor's cabin. Something important was happening, and I wanted to follow it through. I had read and believed that LSD could be used for psychological cleansing. I had taken it several times before, but this time was different. Slowly becoming conscious, I see the games I've been playing with him. He isn't playing. He walks outside of the cabin. I survey its interior, pretending intention, but I wonder what he's doing. From the porch, I can see him looking into a flowering bush. I have to be closer to see. Bees. He's watching honeybees. What century is this? I am in and out of consciousness. The car is against my back. I see him walking toward it, getting in and starting the engine. Climbing in, I'm 
uncomfortably terrified. Am I always terrified? On the rubbery black asphalt, down to the sea, I feel him beside me. And, strangely, within me. He's not what I have thought. Not the back alley boot scuff or social bottom brick. Not a lost child, a sex-starved ex-con, a huckster or trickster, though surely all of those transforming before me he is grand and humble, godly and infernal. In metamorphosis, a startling, substantial phantom. Is it the drug or my mind creating these changes in him? And if so, why do other people not appear in so many forms? The sky shades and rains tenderly. I've badly shortchanged him. I follow a queasy mouthful of panic, and the narrow tar road becomes a sprawling tongue that is swallowing us whole. But he is no comfort. For now, he has no face no features. He is nothing but a chilling emptiness that drops the bottom out of my illusions, leaving me horribly alone. He might be Sharon, hauling me to hell. At the bottom of the hill, he restrained the panting beast and looks to me for a direction. The crossroad offers no hope of escape, and cross it, spread before us, stands a gothic family cemetery, encrusted tombstones, and crosses bulging unevenly from rocky ground. <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm stunned. His disembodied voice sounds sinister. Oh, that's where you want to go. And we roll across the dark divide to a packed dirt drive that passes between the tombstones. Sharp rocks crack and flick from beneath the tires stirring the startled cry of a dove and the sudden flapping of its wings. I think I may have made my final decision. Does death walk alongside life? Or are they opponents? Or both? And why? Why is it necessary? Could I kill myself to avoid this painful end? Or am I dying in fear of it? Fear, born of doubt, brings violent visions rolling down on me, like the salty undertow grabs and plunges the panicky swimmer until up and down are indistinguishable. Experience comes without the buffer of words, in sensations and symbols, the brain code of my dreams. I am standing on ridge rocks in the sun, wind whipped and mesmerized by a gorge of rolling water below. Dank breath rises from the troubled gut. I am paddling along, I am padding along the barren shoreline, 
examining curious rock arches and sea sculptures when the cold chisel bites my feet I am standing horizonward at dusk seeing restless white-capped ghosts in the turbulence my experience is little I have paddled Southern California waters for most of my life with barely a tug from the undertow or a salty tumble but this Pacific Sea could be bitterly cold and hard-handed as it slaps the northern shores I've seen its elegance sliding like liquid glass its playful gushes in frilly lace to flirt and fuss about the necks of the craggy old rocks but I am blind that shock-headed old fisherman may be crazy but he knows that this gentle yielding liquid can kiss and nibble until pits become caverns that it can bash and batter the life out of him hell aches and groans inside me sharp and hot frozen and stinging the hollowness of unwholesome hunger the slow leak of bleeding dry it is choking smothering swallowing the tongue and swallowing the sea pressure without relief the cramp of the womb before it expels us the awful openness into which we are thrust its abandonment in a wet blanket a howling wind through broken windows and running in search of something I can't name I'm hiding so hard that I cannot see and inside faced with eternity when I opened my eyes Charlie was at the wheel where I left him watching the Sun go down he did not assault me even by looking at dusk he started the engine and we moved on to Mary in the musical house of friends and that night as we sat listening to records Charlie asked me for my skate key slipping the chain around his neck he said something ironic and partly to himself something about how he couldn't get over it people outside are more locked up than the ones who are in prison